Robert! Welcome to work. <laughs> so, tell us what you're up to. Uh, well, thank you. So, um, over the next few weeks, I'm filming lots of small mammals uh, and some medium sized ones uh, that all have whiskers. And um, what these mammals do is, is that they use their whiskers for the sense of touch, so much like we use our whiskers. And what we're specifically looking at is how they explore different objects. So we have a square object, and then a, a concave object, and then a convex object. I'm looking at whether they position their whiskers slightly differently uh, when they're exploring different shapes. So we would do that with our fingertips. We would move them over different shapes slightly differently so that we can extract what they are. Uh, and we're hoping that a lot of these guys uh, will do something similar. So um, today we're looking at rats. Uh, we looked at otters yesterday. Uh, we looked at dormice and water voles, uh, house mouse, harvest mouse. Um, wow. Lots of animals. <laughs> so what what do you think your researching is research is telling us? So I look at um, basically active touch sensing. So um, we try and understand uh, how animals behave. Uh, and the thing is, with all behaviour, um, it's driven by sensing. So they have to respond to a, a change or a stimulus in their environment. And so what a lot of small mammals are doing especially is that their main sense is touch. So they use their whiskers on their face. And so as soon as they come across something, their behaviour changes when they touch something. And we're trying to understand more about how they behave and how they respond when they touch different things. So when you think about something like the dormouse or even the rat as well, a lot of the time they clumber around these very um, complex 3D clumbery environments, you know, through trees and things. Um, and they uh, are, are touching and feeling their way around. So they're guiding, say, footfalls, they're jumping over gaps, stretching their whiskers out to guide the way, and they're constantly feeling and then responding to what they're feeling. Do you think they have mental maps of the world through touch that are totally different? Yes, so they do. So definitely in uh, rats and house mouse, it's been found. So whiskers on their face is that they're actually laid out into a grid. So you have rows and columns, they're not just random, and actually many animals have that. So if you look even at dogs and cats, they have these, these grids. And then actually in their brain, different levels of their brain, they have physical structures in their brain that map onto the grid that you see in the whiskers. So if you twizzle like a, a middly whisker, that maps onto a twizzly little area in the brain and a middle bit a little bit further up and a little bit further up. So they, um, yeah. Are, uh, have proper maps which are arranged like their whiskers on their face. What, what do you think you can ultimately understand from this research? What are, is it going to inform? Is there mad speculative ideas how we could benefit us by understanding this amazing new knowledge? Um, for me, I, I like, you know, to, for kind of pure science just to understand, you know, why, why animals do what they do. Um, so that's kind of my passion. Um, we then have kind of, I guess, two branches, is that when you understand more about how animals behave, how they move, we can start to understand more about how they move around their habitats. So something like the dormouse, what we found with the dormouse is their little whisker reach, when they stretched out, was only about 10 centimetres long. And when they couldn't reach across a gap, they actually got a little bit stressed and they started to pace and they started to kind of eat a little bit less and then they'd have to really gear themselves up to kind of jump over a gap bigger than this. And so we can start to think about, goodness, well, if you're a dormouse, you need very joined up habitats. Um, you need to maybe start thinking about what they like best to walk over or move around in and um, things like that. So, um, yeah, understanding more about how these animals behave and move and kind of guide their movement and their locomotion, we just can kind of help them a little bit more. Now the other thing as well is, um, a lot of our work, we actually work with um, robot scientists. Mm. So um, we work with people that are developing tactile robotics. So we work with Bristol Robotics Lab quite a lot. Um, and they're designing tactile robots. So lots of places that we want to send robots into, uh, like space or underwater, uh, down holes, um, where these guys do really, really well. Um, you should use tactile sensors rather than visual ones. If you think you kind of 
you can use it has so much light and so many posh cameras and actually what you can send in is something very tactile and touchy-feely it's, it's much easier it's much simpler to um to do so some of my behavior research and how these sensors are controlled their whiskers in the animal are then put onto uh, robots uh, which go then and explore the world they touch as well that's cool if only you had someone chernobyl blew up there <laughs> yes that would have been that would have been useful. <laughs> yes. All the clever electronics stopped working, didn't they? Because it yeah. was too radioactive. Yeah. So they had to use old-fashioned Russian ones that weren't good enough. That so. were really robust. Yeah, because yeah. it's a great thing about having a tactile robot. is Because the whiskers themselves, they're just, just like hairs. And yeah. they're just dead cells. And they just sit in an innovative follicle. Now, the great thing about having like a whiskered robot is the same. You have sensors that are very close, then you can t put big, long, mm. dead sensors in and just see how they vibrate. So it means that if you stick them in something and you lose the tip or the end, or it's totally fine, and you can just put another cheap sensor in, and it's totally fine. I should imagine some in. incredibly cheap hall sensors Yes. would be ideal. What do they make for mobile phones? If they were connected to one of these, you could have complete three-dimensional knowledge yeah. of the movement of your um, stuff, and done with virtually no processing. Power. Yeah, that's it. So we, um, well, they, not so much me, um, mm. 3D print whiskers, and then stick them in all of that sensor, yeah. and then you get 3D movements of it all. Uh, so you can, you can map the surroundings with a robot, which like you map with a... I utterly nerd out on Hall Effect. <laughs> I find it fascinating. The timing electrons moving through us. Um, through a semiconductor can give you perfect knowledge of its movements. It's insane, wow. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Who we have in here today is a, a brown rat that we have from um, the rat farm from Wildwood. So she was caught up this morning. Um, here she is. She's quite relaxed. She's mainly been cleaning herself this morning. Um, so she was caught up. And then what, um, what we do is, is that we pop her into a nice tube. So um, this is a nice tube here. So they're very relaxed when they popped in a nice tube, and they stay in here. And then what happens is we've got a little, a little hole here, so we can lift this up, um, and they can come out. So she comes out of the hole uh, and into our setup. So she comes out of this hole here and into our arena. Um, so our arena is all made out of perspex because it's see-through so you can see through everything um, and we're quite interested in her like I say in exploring different shapes so she's going to explore here which is a nice square edge and then on a, a concave side and then a convex side and we'll see whether her, her whiskers change depending on what she's exploring. Now um, rat whiskers uh, they move, you'll see like women now um, they actually move in a process called whisking uh, at about eight times per second. Uh, so that's a rat. Something like a dormouse would be moving their whiskers at about ten times per second, and a harvest mouse might, might move it up to about twenty times per second. So this is really fast. Um, so you can't use normal video cameras um, to film because it would be all blurry, a bit like when you use a video camera and you move it quick and it looks blurry around the edges. So what we do instead is we use high-speed uh, video cameras. Uh, so this is my high-speed video camera. So it's, a, it's called a, a phantom camera. And whereas most video cameras that you have might film to about 30 frames per second, I film at 500 frames per second, which means that all the whisker movements are super clear. So I can get really nice clear movements and none of them are blurry, which is fantastic. Um, so we yeah, use this at about 500 frames per second, positioned right above the objects that I want. So I can move it here when I want to look at these, and here when I want to look at this object. Um, oh, there she comes. And then, um, uh, also what's very, very important is a lot of the animals that we look at, so again, the rat, the dormice, um, they're mainly nocturnal, so they're much happier in the dark. Um, so what we need is uh, an infrared light source. So this square floor that she's standing on now is actually a, a light box and it has infrared LEDs, so infrared lighting, that will project right up in the camera. And the camera thinks it's nice and bright and get a really good image. But actually, for us, 
is completely dark and for the animal as well it's completely dark so that means that we can film with all the lights off and they can roam around in the dark quite happily um, and we can get lots of nice footage of them exploring. Wow. So, is Wildwood useful for you? <laughs> Wildwood is, is amazingly useful. Um, so, it's fantastic that they have uh, all of these amazing mammals that we're so interested in. For me, I'm interested in these whisker specialists. So these are a lot of animals which are primary, primarily tactile. So things like the, the otters, the rats, the water voles, the harvest mice, um, door mice, really nice, rich, big whiskers, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but also as well that everyone comes to help me too. So you get all the keepers come, da -da. <laughs> all the keepers come and help me um, so much uh, too. So I mean, I couldn't do this on my own. And so I have help with all of the animals, so it's really nice um, to meet everyone and, and be supported so much as well. Excellent. And what's the next few animals you've got to do? Um, so, uh, we, we did some more otters today, so we think we're going to go and redo. So we did a lot of door mice, harvest mice, wood mice, house mice, which have all been on the square block. Mm -hmm. And we're going to move on to the curb. You've got an otter on now. Yeah. Um, pardon? Did you get an otter in here? Um, no, so we actually we have another setup. Another box. Um, which uh, we actually Lydia's outside mm. with it with the foxes and the uh, and uh, the weasel at the moment, and it's um, a self-standing one. So you just drop it into the enclosure and film with the GoPro, uh -huh. and just as, as yeah uninvasively as possible. So otter footage has just been we just got them straight away. They came over, they explored, they went away. Um, whereas. Yes, some have been a little bit shyer of it, um, but yeah, so we've got we've got lots of that one. So. I filmed the others. I think I tweeted to you. I saw other. it. Yeah. Did you see the, the cavitation from the paw stroke when it really puts oh, full wow. power down? Which is that, that would be fascinating. The 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 power needed to get cavitation. A human can do it. Yeah. That would be. They're uh, um, they're incredible. But yeah. yeah and the, the, I don't know if they use do they use whiskers in underwater. Yeah, I don't know if anyone has really filmed otters underwater. So we use them on, mm. and we film them on land this time. Um, but it would be amazing to see. So I film other aquatic animals. So I film seals and sea lions, mm. um, and they do. So they they tend to when they swim keep them back, yeah. their whiskers back. But when they come to explore something, then they'll push them forwards. Wow! Um, because if you swim with your whiskers forwards all the time, you'd be pushing them yeah. in the water. And so they do, they can really move them. And actually we saw with the otters, um, that again, that when they come up to something, they protract their whiskers and move them really far mm -hmm. forwards. So you could see them do that. So I wonder if they might do something a bit similar um, to other, other aquatic mammals, maybe. But yeah. we don't know yet. Yeah. One day we'll find out. Yeah, we certainly will. <laughs> well, thank you so much for showing us your fantastic and interesting work, Robin. Thank you. And all the best for the future. Thank you very much.